All right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Jay Cole. I'm with the Michigan State Police Emergency Management and Homeland Security Division. Uh, my day-to-day -day job is I'm the Sarah Title III planning professional for the division and for the state, uh, the shop of one. Uh, but besides that, I also serve in the State Emergency Operations Center. So my presentation today, uh, I'll be going over the planning side. Uh, Mr. Mike Young from DEQ, he handles the reporting side. That's kind of the, the first step that gets the planning cycle going. But my presentation also has the historical background of how we got to why facilities need to report and who you report to. In 1980, the Comprehensive Emergency Response Compensation and Liability Act, or CERCLA, was enacted by the U.S. government. Uh, this was brought about by the Vincent Love Canal in New York where hazardous materials started seeping out of the grounds. It was buried underground. They were like, where did this come from? Um, CERCLA is also better known today as Superfund sites. But in 1984, there was a horrible uh, chemical accident in Bhopal, India at a Union Carbide plant. Um, the event happened at the facility. Alarms went off. Town people started going to the site because the alarms were going off. The first responders and then just the general public, well, what's going on over there? It was a methyl isocyanate release and everyone that got close to the facility automatically either dropped over or had long-term health effects from that. So that got the U.S. government thinking, well, if that can happen there, it could possibly happen here. So we need to do something to help safeguard the public and the first responders in the community. So in 1986, CERCLA was reauthorized and became the Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act, or Sarah. Part of the Sarah law uh, was to establish kind of a hierarchy for reporting and who's responsible for what tasks. Um, in Michigan, we enacted the legislation underneath executive order, which means we enforce it as, an, as the unfunded mandate that it was, but we don't get any of the police powers. We don't get to go knock on doors and, and, and levy fines against facilities or communities that do not follow the law. That also means we get to be the nice guys and help you out. So if you have questions, you can come to us before anything gets any farther. So as for the hierarchical structure that was created underneath uh, Sarah, at the state level, there's the Michigan, it was created as the Michigan Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Commission. Today it's known as, everybody ready, the Michigan Citizen Community Emergency Response Coordinating Council, or MICSERC. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, there, must, there must have been a lottery or, or something for, uh, for who could have the, the longest name for what this commission is. Uh, it's, but essentially, it's the State Emergency Response Commission. If you look at other states, it's just the State Emergency Response Commission. But we're all the same, same functions. And one of the first orders that the state mixer had to do was to establish the local emergency planning committees. Uh, here you just see just a quick representation of who's on the state emergency response commission. It's mostly all of the state departments, and then there's uh, 11, yeah, 11 appointed members by the governor. It's a government appoint a governor appointed committee. So if you want to get appointed on it, you have to be friends with the governor or submit your application to his office and hope that he agrees with uh, your stance. But in Michigan, we have 87 local emergency planning committees or LEPCs. Um, that's it. That's another uh, side note. There's a lot of acronyms for this entire legislation, so if I start slipping into them and you don't know which one it is, just raise your hand and I'll hopefully know that I have to go back and explain what it is. Um, when they were originally established, the Mixed Circuit appointed the members to these LEPCs. Uh, it's members that come from fire, police, EMS, industry, agriculture, drain commissioners, just about anybody that can possibly have a potential stake in the community and, and an re emergency response capability should be on that LEPC. Today, it's pretty much self-nominating. It's hard enough to get people to go to meetings they're required to be at. Getting people to come to voluntary ones is going to be even harder. Um, so if you have community activists, environmental groups, and they, they want to have a, a good say on what, how planning should go forth or how to be outreach to the farms and other industry in the area, Bring them into your group. It's not too bad to have a diverse crowd. Uh, we do continue to oversee LEPCs. I am kind of the, the go-to person if they have questions on, hey, we're thinking about doing this. Is we're we going to get sued for it, or we're not going to do that, or we're going to get sued for it, those type of questions. But also for industry, if you want to know who your local emergency planning committee point of contact is, I'm the person you can contact 
and I'll be able to get you their information, email address, possibly even give you their next meeting schedule, because it's all open meetings. It's the Community Right to Know Act, so the community has the right to know what's going on at uh, the, the meetings. As I already said, uh, the LEPC can be made up of multiple uh, backgrounds. Doesn't have to be all, you don't have to have any formal knowledge in emergency management at all. If you're strictly water quality, you can be on it. If you're strictly the health person for your facility, you can, you can be on it. Uh, no one should be excluded just because you don't know the ins and outs of uh, incident command system or emergency management. Each LEPC has an elected or appointed chairperson. They're the person that keeps the, the, the wheels moving. They're going to be your point person if you have, do, do have questions uh, for reporting or planning. Uh, LEPCs are also responsible for receiving the Tier 2 information from the facilities. Um, it's, LEPCs have all the, the power for this federal legislation. Us at the state, we can only merely give guidance and, and say, this is what you need to do. LEPCs have the power to go knock on the door and say, hey, welcome to the, welcome to the community. We saw that you're just brand new. Mind if we know what your chemical inventory is on site? Um, the threshold for reporting under, to the LEPC is zero pounds. So if your LEPC chair or your fire department wants to know what's on site, they have the legal right to know what's on site in a facility. Those reports are submitted through the Tier 2 Manager online system, which is managed by the DEQ. Uh, some of your LAPCs may have online access to that system, otherwise it's a hard copy in the mail to, to get them the information. Once the LEPC gets the information on that Tier 2 report, that's when the planning cycle gets going, and that's when it gets turned over to, to my side of the, the program. Um, planning process. I'm going to skip ahead one right here to go through this process first. So the facility, you've submitted the report, you sent it off to the LEPC, they've cracked open the letter, now they're reviewing what the Tier 2 report says on it. And has the, the extremely hazardous substance box is checked, and you have 3,000 pounds of sulfuric acid on site for 364 days a year. Um, so the LEPC has now reviewed that. They've gone by the list of lists, and it's exceeded all the... The, the thresholds that it needs to exceed, so a plan needs to be created. This is separate from what the on-site plan might be, which is what Mark and Jenner are going to be talking about next. This is for the community. So you have something that's going to potentially exceed the bounds of what the property is or get outside the building. What are first responders going to do to evacuate the neighborhood, the nursing home, schools that are, with, that are just beyond the site borders? South so once the LEPC starts going through that, like, all right, so we have a school, we have a neighborhood, check, check, check. But they're also going to need to know information about the site, because unless you're a major chemical manufacturing company, you probably don't have your own fire department or hazmat team on call all day to take care of the incident. So they're going to want to know floor plan, where is the chemicals allocated, where are the emergency shutoffs for electric, natural gas, all this information. And this is the information that the LEPC has the right to know. So they, you may see a, a, a quick card come and say, hey, we got your tier two report. Do you mind providing us with the floor plan, the emergency shut off this, your emergency contact person, or a 24-hour call number? That's all gets roped into this plan that's then shared with the fire department and kept with the local emergency manager. It's probably pretty grainy and hard to see, but most of you have probably seen a tier two report or have heard of it. If you haven't, it's a two-sided piece of paper that lists your chemical inventory. Not just the extremely hazardous substances, but all um, chemicals that are on site. In Michigan, there's approximately 2,900, some, some drop come on, some drop off weekly. Uh, it's it's, it's a, always a fluid number of, of what facilities are active in the, in the state. Um, for any of the local emergency managers in here, I know there's a few of you in here or people that are on your LEPC, the SARA Title III Community Response Plans should be a part or at least referenced in the countywide emergency operation plan. It's hazardous material incidents aren't the, the big ooh, ah, eye-catching incidents, but they're statistically the most likely to happen in a community. 
everyone has at least some hazardous street that's flowing through your community or at least one AT&T battery switching station somewhere on the side of an expressway. Um, so there should be at least be referenced in the countywide emergency operations plan. The county emergency operation plan and the Sarah Title III community response plans are all open for public, re public review by anyone in the community, hence the Community Right to Know Act. Um, doesn't mean that, they, that you have to send out copies of every email that comes in, hey, we want to know what this site is, what that site is. This, if it's a reasonable and specific request, if you have a concerned neighbor that says, hey, can I come see the plan? They're by law allowed to come see the plan, which is also for facilities. If you want to know what the plan is, you can ask, say, hey, what's this plan look like that you developed five years ago? We want to look at it, make sure that we're all still on the same page. We've added on a wing, we've demolished a wing. So it's, it should be a good working relationship between the community and industry. The LEPCs can't function without the information and support from the LEP or from the facilities, and the facilities can't be within federal compliance without the LEPC. So it needs to be a good working relationship. Everyone needs to be on the same page. I thought that was my timer. I was like, oh, that was a fast half hour. <laughs> So some of the information that goes into the plan, once again, this may be uh, referenced, or you may get a request from the LEPC or the emergency manager or some college intern that got employed for the summer to write the plans for this type of information. The facility contact has this chemical inventory, other chemicals, that's all stuff that can be found on that tier two report. But then you get going in the, through the list of things and there's more specific information that is not included in that tier two report. Um, the, like I've already said, the facility floor plan. Uh, what are the notification procedures that the facility is going to follow? Do, do you have a, a, a central command 24-hour station that, that's going to be the first point of contact that someone on the floor is going to call? Or is there a set emergency management coordinator for the facility that's going to make the call? Who's going to be that point person? So if no one's there on a holiday weekend, or if they're, excuse me, and something in a first responder sees something going on at the facility, who can they then call to say, hey, there's smoke coming from your back lot over there. You may want to get someone out there to check it out, or do we, or can we go back there and, and see what's going on? Um, transportation routes of chemicals, that's something that the, that the LEPC may not know, but the facility knows that, hey, yeah, we buy it from Jay's Chemical down in uh, Gron, so it's going to come up this road and take that way to get to our facility. So if you have that kind of, of first-hand knowledge, it makes the process much easier for the, the LEPC to, to finish the plans. Um, for creating the, the plans, it's, it's no, we're more interested in the information, not what it looks like. So if you have your own program that, that develops what, it's supposed to, what your plan is going to look like or you follow the, the 20 some page rubric that I created that covers absolutely everything that would ever need to be in any plan for emergency response. If, if the informa information is good, the plan is good. Uh, I review every one of them one by one. So having a little variety is, is, is good. Everyone gets tired of vanilla ice cream after a while. Um, so if, if, if your industry and facilities have your own set information that you want included or any specific information that the facility wants to be included or that, that your community wants to have, it's quite okay to, to develop your own set of requirements of what's going to be in these emergency response plans. As I've already said, all real enforcement power for uh, this legislation is at the local level. That, let's read it. That, this is a big point is that for first responders, fire department, LEPCs, they can ask any facility to report chemicals on site. That they may fall outside of what is on the list of lists or extremely hazardous substances, but if you're a paint manufacturing company, you have rows and rows of paint that's available for purchase from a retailer. It's a retail exemption, so you may not have to report it under this, that, or another statute. But it's a good thing to know if there's going to be a fire that you now have, you know, 10,000 gallons of paint lining the, the, the stock walls in some room. So that's the additional information that's, that should be included in this type of planning. Uh, if a facility want, wants, to, wants to play hardball and not give the information to the first responders, then the LEPC or fire department does have the legal right to file a lawsuit against the facility to get this information. I would highly uh, recommend that the facility does not try to withhold information from the LEPC. Uh, several facilities in Colorado and Pennsylvania have actually 
been sued by their LEPC, and it's not a very good PR uh, to say that you're withholding information from fire department uh, members. Uh, so it's, it's all, we're all on one team. It's the state police's new say, we're all one team. So we're all here in, to, to protect not only the facility and property, but the, the workers there who may probably live in the community that you're writing the plans to protect. Um, that's it for the, for the slide portion, but I'm going to go off uh, a little bit here to, to just talk about a, a few other small items for this. I've already warned uh, the, the, the DEQ crowd last night that I do ha happen to uh, get off track and start talking randomly about <laughs> things that, that are directly involved with what my PowerPoint is, so hopefully I don't get too uh, lost here. I go back just a couple slides. The goals and visions. Uh, the community preparedness part is in promoting cooperation. It, it's it's something that that we're, I, I see routinely. There'll be facilities that only meet the the regulation to the, the minimum point that they legally have to. Um, so I would just in, in encourage any facilities here to, to be proactive with your emergency planners uh, for, your, for your communities. It, it's, it's a very tough job <laughs> that, that they have to try and get this information, uh, especially if you have any ties in with the, any agricultural or farms. Uh, underneath the, the legislation, the farms only need to initially report their hazardous chemical inventory. So when the big push was made originally in the early 90s and late 80s to get everybody compliant, you had J. I. Colt's farm, Joe I. Colt's farm, <laughs> Scott I. Colt's farm, all reported their initial chemical inventories for anhydrous ammonia, while everyone's slowly moving away from anhydrous ammonia to, to safer technology, but they're still on the books is that they have anhydrous ammonia on site because they're not required to do an annual follow-up. So if any of you have any tie-ins with, you know, up here, the cherry growers or fresh fruit, if you can make a, a good outreach to them, or if you know any co-ops out there, to say, hey, you're still on our list from 1988 that you have 10,000 pounds of anhydrous ammonia. Do you still have this, yes or no? And if they don't, then you can work with DEQ. They can be able to potentially get taken off this list so they're no longer this kind of dark cloud that's overhanging the LAPC. Well, we have 550 facilities, 30 of them are farms. We have no information from them for the last 20 years. Um, so if, 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 if you're not directly involved with them, if you know your neighbor or a friend that, that, that may be falling underneath that, if you could pass along either my information or someone at DEQ's information, that's on the last slide here that I'll be bringing up, that's greatly appreciated. Um, the same goes for any new facilities that you may see popping up. Um, if, it, if it's a small mom and pop shop or a small industry that's just getting going, they may not know all the ins and outs of, of what they're required by law to report. As I sat through some sessions yesterday, there's a lot of stuff that goes on for facilities that I didn't know about. I doubt that anyone that's just starting up a business has time, they're more worried about making the ends meet instead of getting federal regulations all, all in check. So if, if you know somebody that's starting a new business or you've seen a new business start, reach out to them or point the, your LEPC members, your emergency, local emergency manager, your fire chief, somebody in the right direction and say, hey, they're just opening up shop down here. This is the contact person for who it is. They're, ex they're expecting you to call. So if, if we're all in this together, it's going to make things a lot better and make our communities better prepared. So with that, is there any questions?